Well, hey everyone, welcome to our fifth FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin and I'm the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So I'm thrilled to be offering this introductory FreeBSD content to people around the world. It's really given us an opportunity to connect to the community as well as to new people who are interested in learning more about FreeBSD. Now some logistics. Uh, remember that you can find all the upcoming and uh, previous talks um, on our website in the YouTube channel, and we'll make sure that we paste that URL in the um, in the Slack channel here. And if you have any questions during the talk today, please proceed that question. Well, you can post it in the Slack channel and or IRC channel and uh, proceed it with a queue so we know it's a question. So our next talk is an introduction to ZFS by Dan Langell. Now, most of us know Dan as the person behind BSD CAN and PGCon. But Dan's been using FreeBSD since 1998, and almost immediately he started documenting his experiences. This online journal eventually became the FreeBSD Diary. He's very good at describing the step-by-step -step procedures to perform a wide variety of tasks from changing your prompt to creating and maintaining jails. Having studied as a software engineer, Dan has picked up sysadmin and database skills along the way, and now works as a sysadmin for an Intel SAC company. He's the founder of BSD CAN, PGCon, Freshport, and Fresh Source. He's an avid mountain biker and the most inquisitive person I know. So now I'll hand this off to Dan. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Dan here. Um, thank you for that intro. I'm just going to get uh, started here with sharing my screen because that's the only way you're going to get to uh, see the uh, slides. So right now you're just going to see a mountain. And now you should see the first slide. So I've been using ZFS since about 2010. Uh, I can only figure that out because I was looking back in blog posts, and that's the first time that ZFS appears. I think I'd started using it before that, though. And it's no exaggeration when I say that ZFS has greatly improved my file system experience, both as a user and an admin. And this is both for everyday use and for backups. It's just so amazing to be able to use snapshots for backups and uh, just to go to be able to go back and pick up a file from 15 minutes ago after I did something accidentally. So what we're going through here, I want to make a couple of disclaimers because I'm sure that some of you are not ZFS newbies, and this talk is is definitely not for you. Um, I'm going to be grossly simplifying almost everything that we're talking about because this is for newbies. I'm going to admit stuff, omit stuff that you really should know, but which you can figure out later by just reading some documentation. There's going to be options skipped because all of this is for newbies. And don't worry about that. You just need an introduction, and that's what we're here to do. Now, this is a huge list, and you don't have to read it, but this is an overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, some of it is in-depth. Some of it is just a, a brief introduction to something, and other things are examples of what to do and what not to do. And most of them will be just gone over very quickly, just so you get an idea of, yes, it can be done, so that later on when you go to do it, you say, oh, yeah, I remember this. A short set of origins. <clears throat> this is not a complete list of all the timelines, uh, especially not um, recent changes uh, to the ZFS uh, project. Um, it's interesting for his historical purposes to know where it came from and where it is now, but it's not going to stop you from 
making any progress for ZFS. Not listed in here is the Oracle acquisition of, of Sun, and ZFS is still developed in-house there. And it's important to note now that Open ZFS uh, development occurs under the Open ZFS project. I'm not all up to date on what everything is called, but I know that it, it's changed. Stuff you can look up if you go on Wikipedia and look all this up. You're not going to run out of uh, out of things with ZFS. The the limits and built-in uh, numbers are just far beyond what any of us will need in our lifetimes. So we're getting into the gross simplification part. Uh, the next few slides are very simplified. Think of ZFS as a file system which combines both system and volume manager features, if you're familiar with system and volume managers. If you're not, don't worry about that. Um, RAID Z, I'll talk about that. And it's not RAID 5, and it's not RAID 6. So, so don't think of it in terms of hardware RAID or any terms that you're familiar with from there. Instead, think of RAID ZN as being the ability to lose N devices without losing your data and still have a functioning system. So if we're talking about RAID Z1, you can lose one drive out of all the drives that you have. If it's RAID Z2, it's two drives, and if it's RAID Z3, it's three drives. And don't think of it as having parity drives either. If you have eight drives in an array and you're running RAID Z2, it's any two of those eight drives that can die. You can't point at the eight drives and say, OK, these two here are the parity drives. No, that's not how it works. It means any two of the drives in the array can be lost without losing any data. And by the way, think of RAID Z as buying you time to relate, replace a failed drive. Um, sometimes people say, oh, it'll, it'll be fine. I've got RAID Z2. Uh, I can lose two drives and not lose any data. Think of it as when the drive dies, you've got time to replace that drive. Uh, you, you may you might want to do it right away or might want to wait, wait until Saturday, but the sooner you do it, the better. I uh, already said they're going to be simplified. What's a z-pool? A z-pool is your basic building block. You get a bunch of drives together. Uh, you pool all the resources together, and it becomes a z-pool. What do you do with the z-pool? You do a z-pool create, and it operates on drives, which are probably vdevs, which are virtual devices. You can do on, on raw drives, but most people do them on vdevs because a, a drive is actually vdev. Um, but it, think, of, think of it in terms of a z-pool consists of vdevs. Now, there's a lot of different zpool variations. You, you can create different types of zpools with based upon different types of vdevs. So you can create a mirror, a stripe, or a raid z. A mirror can consist of two or more drives. You can create a mirror of a mirror zpool which has three drives, and you can lose two of those drives, and the zpool is still fine. You can create a RAID Z of one to three drives, and I think the minimum is four drives. I seem to recall that this, this might have been an error. It might be three drives. You might be able to create a RAID Z1 with three drives, but I don't remember. But I, it's at least four plus, I think. So a stripe. You can put two drives together and stripe over both of them but there's no resilience there. If one of the drives dies, you've lost that Z pool altogether. And that that's a point we'll come back to later on, I think. Um, if you, your Z pool is only as good as the VDEVs within it, if one VDEV dies within a Z, Z pool, you've lost the Z pool. Um, so your, re, your resilience and your ability to recover from a failure is at the VDEV level, not at the Z pool level. We'll, we'll keep that in mind because a zpool can consist of one or more vdevs. We'll come back to that. I want to talk about file systems for a second. You have ZFS create, which operates on a zpool. 
creates a file system. First, you create the zpool, and then you allocate file systems within that zpool. Z, uh, file systems can be hierarchical with, within a zpool, and they can inherit properties from the parent. For example, here's a here's a uh, file system we've created. Uh, zroot is happens to be the name of the zpool that we created, but then we created Z, zroot users dan projects foo. That happens to be mounted at, at USR home dan projects foo, but you can mount it anywhere. That that mount is just based on the path name but you don't always have to know the ZFS name to know where the path is, and the path doesn't have to be related to the ZFS file system. We'll, we'll see more about that later. So pooling your drives. This is one of the things that a zpool gives you. Um, if you're used to UFS systems where you typically will partition up a drive and you allocate some space to VARDB, um, but you've got lots of space on, on USR. Often your solution there, if you've run out of space for MySQL, is you move everything over to USR and you create a symlink. You don't really have that problem with Z, with a zpool because all your space is in the zpool. It's not partitioned up and mounted at different places on the drive. That's an example of an oversimplification. We'll come to that later. Here's an example of a zpool that I created. It's The name is Z, zroot, and it has 9.3 gig free. Um, don't worry about the other fields. Just be familiar with what a zpool list looks like. Oh, yeah. Uh, this output doesn't show any all the columns, and it's here just to show you what it looks like. This particular zpool is from a digital open droplet I created for external monitoring of services. So we're gonna, gonna give an example of, of how you create a zpool from just a bunch of drives. The JBOD will come in later. So you select your drives and you say, okay, I'm gonna create a VDEV out of those drives from this bunch that I have in my system. Now, from, from here, You've created a zpool from this vdev, which is a collection of drives, and I'll explain here. I've had to comment out parts of the slide and add more comments in. I took this from uh, some documentation, but it sort of was misleading because people didn't know enough about what was going on. So this result is probably better for newbies. <clears throat> Uh, right here, we have a zpool, which is the big re uh, square rectangle around the outside, and it consists of three vdevs. The topmost vdev is a RAID Z3. You'll see that three blue drives are there. It's not three specific drives. We talked about this earlier. The blue drives just indicate how many drives can be lost without losing data. Um, Actually, that's not accurate either. We'll get down to that in a second. Now, the VDEV on the left is a RAID Z2. It's six drives, and you can lose two of those drives and not lose any data. Now, over on the next one, the VDEV is a three-way mirror, and they're all blue. So no, you can't lose all three drives. You can just lose two. Um, the reason that we're talking about this is the original documentation referred to these as parity drives. Um, but people sort of thought, oh, I can only lose those two drives. No, that's not what it is. You can lose any of the two drives in the RAID Z2, any three of the drives in the RAID Z2. But in a mirror, so long as you have one drive left working, the mirror will still work. Here's a ZFS file system. This lists all the file systems on this host. The zroot is the name of the pool. Um, zroot slash root, this one here, is actually um, a data set within that zpool. Um, 
it doesn't have to be named root, but that's the way it is. I've seen it called boot environment, whatever. You can call it whatever it is, it, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be root. Now, what is a VDEV? This is an important, uh, important concept to keep track of. A VDEV can be a single drive. It can be a mirror two or more drives. So this is where we get into a VDEV can be a physical device or it can be a collection of physical devices. A VDEV can also be a RAID Z. So if we go back to the Z pool we looked at before, we had each of these, uh, we, ha we had a mirror and a RAID Z within a VDEV. So there's some terms that we're gonna use in the following um, slides. I use file system and data set interchangeably. The documentation jumps back and forth between the two, and I consider them to be basically the same thing. But technically speaking, a data set can be a file system with ZFS create. It can be a volume, and that term isn't commonly used. And a data set can also be a snapshot, which is a read-only version of a file system. And we'll get into we'll talk more about snapshots later. Some interesting properties of a zpool. Sorry, no, of a file system. You can set compression on. LZ4 is a very nice compression. It'll actually abort compression if it notices incompressible data. So it'll try and say, oh no, this isn't compressing, goodbye. A time. It's fewer writes. Basically, when you write data, it'll update the A time, which is a second write. Most of us don't need to know the last time the data was accessed. So I turn off a time and so do a lot of other people. Exec equals no. It prevents running of code, say from slash temp, for example. Might be useful to you. Uh, sometimes it's not useful. Reservation, that keeps 10 gigs spare for say you run database dumps every night and you always wanna have 10 gigs spare on the drive to be able to do that. You've got that. Uh, quota, it keeps users or apps under control. Uh, there's a lot more to these properties and how they operate hierarchically, but you've got lots of time to read up on that. This is just so you know they exist. <coughs> Pardon me. So the inevitable is happening. You have a failed drive. What do you do? The first step is identifying the drive. And a serial number is ideal. Um, sometimes you can use GPART to put the uh, serial number as a label on the drive. If the old drive is still alive and working and it's just degraded, keep it in the system if you can. The system is still running. And if you remove it and another drive dies, you may wind up with an un un unusable Z pool altogether. So if you, if the drive, still works, leave it on the drive. Uh, in this case, the the label I've used, this is actually the serial number of the drive. Um, so I added the new drive into the system and I issued this Z pool replace where this is the old one and this is the new one. I can never remember which one is the new, which one is the old. Read the documentation. Once the Z pool is Replace is done, it'll kick the old drive out of the system, um, and then you can just remove that failing drive. It that replace that kick out happens automatically. Uh, look at Z pool status to find out what's going on. There'll also be entries in var log messages. So, in these photos, I'm going to show you something that you should not do. This is a system I had at home when I had to replace a hard drive. Uh, at the top left are three HBAs uh, with cables coming from the front of the box. Uh, the shiny thing here is the heat sink, and this is the part that you shouldn't do. I tossed the replacement spare drive in there and worked on it and got it replaced and then reversed what I did and took it back out and put it where it should be. So that's one way that you can do this. I don't recommend it, but it can work if all your drive bays are full. And this is a very good photo of showing you why having spare drive bays is a good idea. Don't use a RAID card. 
Raid will try to fish, fix the issue itself and then drop the drive, never giving ZFS a chance to do its magic. So Raid hides stuff. Um, it'll try to fix it and then report back to the OS that the drive is dead, goodbye. Uh, that's not what you want. ZFS loves your drives. It absolutely does. It'll do everything it can to try and fix it. And if it fails, it'll look somewhere else on one of the other drives. Um, use an HBA, not a RAID card. That said, some RAID cards can be flashed into IT mode. And I say then it's a, an HBA, not a RAID card. Pay attention to the FreeNAS project. They have a lot of information about what works great on FreeBSD for a um, HBA. Uh, HBA is host bus adapter, but you don't need to know that. You just need to know you don't want to use a RAID card. Scalability. We're going to talk a little bit about you've created a Z pool. You did it three years ago, and now you need more space. How do you do that? Well, you can upgrade all the drives. You add a new VDEV, and boom, you've got all this magical new space. Um, you can add new disk banks. Like Here's another five drives. You add it into the Z pool, or you can create a separate Z pool. I'm now the approach of where I have separate Z pools for separate, separate specific reasons, and I only expand a Z pool when I need more data in that Z pool for that specific purpose. When you're upgrading the drives, you can do one at a time, or you can, like I said earlier, you can put them all in. Um, you may have heard that ZFS is not expandable. What they mean is you can't yet add a new drive to a RAID Z and magically get more space. There's a whole lot of math that goes on, um, and there's a fix in the works to allow that. But it's not as big a blocking point as you think. On to the next. We're going to talk briefly about data integrity. And data integrity is one of the big selling points of ZFS. So ZFS has a lot of metadata. And what it does with that metadata is magical. A lot of that metadata is checksumming. And it's checksumming all the way down. And what it does with those checksums is it finds errors. It reads information from the disk. And if it doesn't match the checksum, it'll tell you. At least you'll find out that the data is corrupt. Without checksums, you don't find out about that. It also tells you about other errors that it may find. Um, ZFS will also look for errors and correct them automatically without you knowing about it. Uh, because there is redundancy within RAID Z, if it finds correct information elsewhere, it'll come and automatically correct the error that it has found, and the system just carries on as if nothing happened. So there's something called scrubbing. How scrub works is it reads everything that's been written to disk and make sure that the checksums match. And this is a very good preventative feature. I suggest you enable it. Uh, I run it weekly. You can decide how often you want to run it. Um, it runs in the background. And it will find any errors if there are errors. And you'll find out about it. And it may help you to detect a disk problem before it actually becomes a bigger problem. So enable scrubs on your systems. Mirrors. I like mirrors. I install the operating system on mirrors. Um, you can create two mirrors and stripe over all of them. Um, my my Pudrier build server has a bunch of SSDs in it. And it's it's all basically mirrors, two 500 gig mirrors, and then another 500 gig mirror, giving me a total of one terabyte over four drives. And it's it's fast. It's very nice. We're going to talk about RAID Z. 
And RAID Z is typically one to three three drives. I don't have any RAID Z ones. I'm pretty sure they're almost all RAID Z twos and some RAID Z threes. I think the RAID Z three that I have is mostly for backup data. Um, and I have two RAID Z twos that are striped over each other, so it's about a twenty seven terabyte. Z pool and it's two RAID Z2s. So I know we talked briefly about VDEVs, and if you lose a VDEV, you lose the Z pool. Keep that in mind when you're designing your Z pools. So although, though I have two RAID Z2s and I'm striping over them, if I lose two drives within the same RAID Z2, I'm okay. If I lose a third drive in that RAID Z2, the Z pool is gone, but if it's in the other RAID Z2, I'm okay. So that's one of the Z pools that I replace drives as quickly as I can. We're going to go over some very quick configurations. And if you're familiar with Gpart and stuff like that, this may help you. If you're not familiar with Gpart and how to partition drives, your eyes might get a little glassy. But this is just to get you started and give you an idea for when the time comes of, oh, yeah, I remember that slightly. Here's an example of where, where I've created um, a partition table on DA0 and where I've created a ZFS partition on there. And I've used this serial number as the label for this drive. We'll see later on when that, that comes into use. But now I've got a, a drive. Uh, that's set up like this. I created other partitions on this drive. This is pretty standard. Um, this happens to be a FreeBSD boot drive. The sizes vary according to what size of drive you have. But now that I've got two of these, uh, I put them together into this mirror. Oh, sorry. Oh, back. Sorry about that. Now, this is my. This is a Z pool called My Data. The VDEV actually consists of two partitions on two different drives. And I did Z pool create My Data. It is a mirror of these two partitions. So there's my VDEV at that level. And my Z pool is at the blue level. And it's very straightforward, very simple. Going on to the next one. This is the zpool status of that zpool, which is called my data. And you can see that, um, oh, I see I changed this. This is, a, this is a copy and paste error. So here's the mirror level. There's the one partition. There's the other partition. And there are no errors in, in here at all. So I'm going to do another zpool create this time it's going to be with four four drives and it's going to create a raid z1 so it's zpool create my data raid z1 drive one drive two drive three drive four and it's all p1 and again there's my vdev there's my zpool and the redundancy is at this level so i can lose one of the drives and again, I emphasize it can be any one of these drives can die. And this VDEV is still OK, and the Z pool is still OK. Here's a RAID Z2. It's basically the same as the RAID Z1, only one more drive added into it, and it's called RAID Z2. That is the type of the Z pool. Again, any two of these drives can die, and the Z pool and the VDEV will both still be OK. RAID Z3, similar concept, not very different. Just now you can have three drives die. Here's the Z pool status of that RAID Z3 from the RAID, no, the RAID Z2 from earlier. Here's one that has the drive in it, the serial number labeled on the partition. The other ones weren't set up that way. Now, 
this is the first Z pool example we've had with two V devs. What you do here is you do Z pool create. I call this one tank fast. And I'm creating, creating a mirror out of these two drives and another mirror out of those two drives. So here's the first mirror, which is a VDEV. And there's the second mirror, which is a VDEV. And each one is two drives. And together, these two VDEVs make up this Z pool. So going back to what I said, you might think you could lose two drives out of this and be OK. And you can, so long as they're in separate VDEVs. If you were to lose both drives out of one VDEV, this Z pool would be dead. It would be gone because the redundancy and resilience is at the VDEV level. If you lose a VDEV within a Z, Z pool, the Z pool is gone. Remember that when you're designing. Here's the Z pool status of the previous uh, um, Z pool. And you've got the two different mirrors in there and the two drives with each mirror and Z pool status. That's what that looks like. So what you might ask, well, here's some other cool stuff you can do. You can mount within mounts. Um, so you get a bunch of slow drives for the main system, but you also have some fast SSDs for special use. So what you do is you create a Z pool on the SSDs and then mount them at VARD Postgres. You just set the mount point to be there. So then when you do a ZF, ZFS list, you've got your separate Z pool called data01 with Postgres on it. And you set your mount point to be var db Postgres. So according to the rest of the system, this is just files. It doesn't even know that it's on a different set of drives. And neither should it know, because it's just file system. But this is what I do on my database servers, is I have the faster drives mounted on very good SSDs set up differently from the Z root. And it works very well. It's very transparent. It's a bit like Simlinks that we talked about at VARD, for VARDB MySQL, but this is much superior, both in file system and database. I want to talk about BE Admin, which was a tool that we used exclusively before we get to something called BECTL. What they do is they allow you to manage boot environments. And a boot environment is a ZFS file system, which is designed for booting. You install the kernel there. You boot from there. You can install a newer OS, boot from that. Um, you can create multiple boot environments and choose the one you want. Maybe you're testing a new kernel or a new drive. You can boot, test, revert back to another boot environment, or just maybe you want to upgrade to the latest version of the OS, create a new boot environment. Just save your old one so that you can go back to it. It's, it's a safety net. It really is useful. Basically, when I'm upgrading to a new version of the OS, even just, say, install running FreeBSD update uh, to get the latest patches just in case. Save your current boot environment by doing a BECTL uh, create, whatever you want to call it. But save your current one, then upgrade the one that you're running in, reboot, everything OK, great. If not, reboot and choose the boot environment that you just saved via the bootloader. It will help you one day. I promise you, you will get into trouble, and boot environment will save your butt. Also, lookup next boot is a command line utility, which allows you to select the kernel to use on the next boot and only on that boot. Um, maybe you're doing some kernel development. That'll help you. Quotas. It's a property on a, on a data set. Um, and it allows you to say, OK, this user can only use this amount of space, or this jail can only use this amount of space. Um, say you just want to make sure that 
you have space available in the whole system, you can set a quote on various uh, file systems and say, OK, just make sure that we keep all of this spare. Um, keep in mind that quotas include descendants and snapshots. So if you're setting them high up in your file system tree, uh, keep in mind everything that's below it. Uh, I tend to set quotas at the end of a uh, path in a file system name, not higher up, just for that reason. But it's always available if you want to put it at the higher level. Now, monitoring ZFS is very easy. I scrub weekly, like I said, and I also have a Nagios system check that goes in and says, how old is the latest scrub on this system? And it finds out. Um, Nagios also looks at ZPool status, and it also monitors various quotas. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I wrote custom Nagios scripts for this. I think you can find that. Um, also monitor your zpool capacity. You don't really want to get over 80%. Um, you can, but sometimes some things sort of then become difficult. And by difficult, I don't mean it grinds to a, a screaming halt. I just mean that sometimes if you get z big zpools, with a lot of uh, space in them, uh, keep an eye on it. Try not to get over 80. Um, especially pay attention to your system once it starts going over 80 and see if it gives you any trouble. If it doesn't, you're fine. But just don't go 100% full. We're going to do some myth busting. This won't take very long, but ZFS has been a long, long around long enough that certain myth myths have begun to creep in, and this is mostly about hardware. I only have one drive on this system. ZFS won't be any use to me. No, that's not true. A single drive ZFS is better than no ZFS at all. You'll get checksums, snapshots. You won't be able to detect errors unless you're doing something like extra copies, which is an advanced topic. You'll get told about those errors, but they won't be corrected like they would be in a, in a mirror or a RAID Z. You do not need ECC RAM. The system is better with ECC RAM. Um, it's recommended for ZFS, but you can get away without it. And as people much smarter than me have said, ZFS without ECC is better than no ZFS at all. So you're still better off with ZFS, even if you don't have ECC RAM. High-end hardware. <laughs> Most of my hardware is consumer-grade drives. That's one of the beauties of, of, of ZFS, is that you can use consumer-grade drives, and it will detect errors on them. Sure, you can build a really fancy system, with enterprise-based drives and use ZFS, but for home use, I'm I'm using commercial off-the-shelf drives, certainly not using enterprise drives. HBAs are about $100 used off e eBay. I think they're even cheaper now. I think they've dropped to about 60. Uh, the prices vary according to demand because I'm talking about used drives here. These are not new HBA, uh, although I remember seeing new ones recently. There's a lot of older LSI stuff that you can get. Yes, I do have some super micro chassis, but you don't need those. I started off on regular PC chassis, and you can too if you just want to try ZFS. I've mentioned it before. FreeNAS has amazing support and amazing uh, set of knowledge for, for ZFS. Look at what they've written. Loads of RAM. No, you don't need loads of RAM. It, it is nicer with loads of RAM, but I have ZFS systems running with one gig of RAM, and they run adequate for what they need to be doing, which is running Nagios. And that system runs with 250 meg free. It's a DigitalOcean droplet, the one I used in the previous examples, and it does what I need. It, you're not going to get high, highfalutin performance out of it, but it doesn't need to. All it's doing is Nagios, and I'm fine with it being slightly slower to do things for me. 
So that's the end of the myths that I had. Here's a list of things for you to do when you start playing around with ZFS or even just reading up on them. Snapshots. I can't emphasize enough how fantastic snapshots are for backups. I mean, you should take a snapshot and back up that snapshot because it is a consistent view of the file system at a point in time. And using a snapshot to back up means that you avoid the situation where you back up one log file and then another and then another, and they're all out of touch with each other because it may take you 20 seconds to back up one log file. And by then, the next log file is another 20 seconds worth of data. And that's not good. Um, you're looking at an inconsistent set of log files. So snapshots on your system are not backups, but it's a way for you to take a backup. Remember that. Snapshots are not backups. They're just another copy on your system. Snapshots are read-only. More importantly, they are immutable. Not only read-only, but immutable. They cannot be modified. And therefore, yeah, they're fantastic by backups, but I can see them being used for forensics as well because they're read-only. Uh, and by the way, I said this, snapshots on the same host are not backups. Copy those snapshots somewhere else, and then they might be a backup. Speaking of somewhere else, you can send your snapshots. You can share your snapshots with another host. And keep in mind that other host does not have to be running ZFS. It's nice if they are, but they don't have to be because what you're sending is just a file. And you can save that file as another file. It's not ZFS, it's just another file. But you can send it to another host. Um, that other host can be in another data center. It can be on the computer down in your basement. It can be on your same computer. You can ZFS send a snapshot within the same computer. Yeah, I already said snapshots on another host are backups, but make sure that they are backups. Definition of backups is outside scope. So one thing you can do with snapshots is use them for clones for quickly spinning up something. And I heard this idea, uh, I forget where, but instantly it became a great idea for me. So snapshot your database at rest, then clone it. And then you can snapshot a copy of that database to be used for um, development purposes. Because you can't run off a snapshot because it's read only, but the clone can be writable. So now you have quickly have a copy of your dev or production database that you can run some tests on. And when you're done, throw it away. And then when you need to run more tests on it, you can clone it again and run more tests. And I think this is just an amazing use of snapshots and clones. You can snapshot a development environment that your developers may need. Um, and then they can go and use it. And when they're done with it, they just toss it away. It's just a given starting point for, a, for an environment. You can snapshot a set of files, uh, manipulate them, and then when you're done, throw them away because it's just a clone of a snapshot. Now, I say when you think make dear, consider Z ZFS create. I'm not saying use ZFS. F ZFS create everywhere that you use make dear. I'm saying when you go to create another directory, you're thinking, I got to put something in here. And I'm suggesting that you think maybe I should create a separate file system for this. Put all your photos in, in one file system because then you can snapshot them and send them away somewhere. And you can set the compression level accordingly because video and snapshots don't tend to compress very well. Um, you can set quotas on them. You can you can just treat them differently than another file system. You got a project, sooner or later you're going to want to back up that project or maybe, maybe take a snapshot of, of it. Remember, snapshots are at the file system level. 
You can't snapshot just your directory, a directory. You have to snapshot it at the file system level. So if you create a new file system for this new project, you will be able to snapshot it and come back to it later. So here I am doing the make deer thing. So when you do make deer, consider ZFS create. So uh, we're going to go through some other tips that I've been thinking about over the past little while. Most of these came up late one night. I was creating these slides, and I've added to them over time. I like to run my OS on a Zeta fast mirror and put all the data everywhere else. Uh, I just think it's a good idea to boot off something that is not your main data drives. I like to connect that ZFS mirror directly to the motherboard because booting off the motherboard is generally very straightforward and very easy. And it's a lot less hassle sometimes than booting off an HPA. Uh, that said, a friend of mine just is building up a new Plex server and he's added an extra HPA just for the boot off the ZFS mirror. And that's a nice compromise. I, I I just don't like to start booting off a big ZFS data array. I've run run into problems with that in the past. You have to keep all the partitions right, and it, it's just sometimes they present different drives to you. The BIOS says, "What are these 500 drives here?" Uh, no, just keep it simple and and put the OS on a separate set of mirror set of drives in a mirror. I say now. You can put your boot system on UFS and put all your data on um, ZFS. That should work. And as I, as I already mentioned, don't boot from the HBA. It, it, it's a principle I follow and try to follow at work as well as home. Don't always get there, but I try. Uh, Savage Light mentioned these uh, tips. Um, BIOS on your HBA will go through and enumerate all the drives, and that takes time. If you tell the HBA that you're not going to boot off there, it may be faster to boot. Although I found that I couldn't get my system to boot unless I had the BIOS on the HBA uh, enabled, even though I was booting off drives directly connected to the motherboard. So. SSDs used in the OS mirror are sometimes so huge, uh, it far exceeds the capacity, uh, sorry, the amount of space you need to put the OS on. So sometimes you can multi-purpose those drives, say for L2ARC or caching of the data pool, and you can also use it as a log device. Uh, this is basically an advanced topic, but keep it in mind when you get to that point. Most of us do not need a separate intent log. Uh, when you come across that, you don't need a separate intent log. Most of us don't need that. Uh, I don't think I'm running out on most of my systems. You got lots, lots of large files on a data set. Try setting a record size to one meg. Uh, you'll, you'll find that you actually have a lot more space if you do that or a lot more of available space because there's less metadata being written because you're using uh, bigger records. And the metadata is at the record size level. So instead of a record size of 128K, you use one meg and you have more available space. We reached almost the end of the slide deck. So what did we cover? Remember that slide that slide at the front that I said not to pay much attention to? And that's where we are now. Um, the last slide is actually Libra M NMS showing a ZFS replace, which started about here. And so it's really, really fast, and it gets to the end. And then I think that's the final little bit of stuff. Um, that's the last slide. Going to stop sharing, so I'm back with me. and. I'm ready for questions if anyone has questions. So far, Dan, you did such a good job. We don't have any questions. That's OK. Yeah. 
<clears throat> folks want to add them now, now is a good time. I'm not exaggerating when I say the ZFS is so, so much fun to work with. Um, I remember going to the first talk, and I think it was um, Powell's talk, Powell, um, PJD imported ZFS into FreeBSD. And when I listened to his first talk, I was just saying, oh, my God, this is really what I want. I want this. And I've been using it ever since. And I'm just so glad that so many people are getting to to, to try it out now. Anybody has any last minute questions? I know. I think Dan explained things so well that no one had any questions, yep. which is great. I mean, it's always nice when there's questions. But um, I guess if any questions come in later, you could always um, you could post them on these channels, this channel still, and we can get Dan to answer. And we could always tweet questions and answers later. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, great. So, um, see here. Mine, my screen. Um, so, anyway, so Dan, I want to thank you for giving such a great talk. I um, I did love how you explained just the foundations of of ZFS. I mean, just the basics, and you gave such excellent and but simple examples. And so, um, actually, I mean, for me who I never really fully understood ZFS very well. It really helped um, give me that foundation. So now I could explore, explore more after this. So I'm excited about that for me, as well as uh, people who've watched this, as well as people who will be watching the recording too. So um, I want to let everyone know that we're going to move the FreeBSD Fridays to um, every other Friday, starting on um, two weeks from today. And that's August 28th. And um, that's just to give you all a break. So you don't um, have to spend every Friday watching uh, these talks. But um, so far, they've been excellent. And we have a whole lineup coming up. And we'll be posting that schedule soon. Uh, but next week, uh, we will um, have someone coming in who will be giving an introduction to security on FreeBSD talks. So um, I'm really excited about that. So anyway, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dan, and we'll see you in two weeks. So bye.